pray and we will get to this. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of looking at a just an amazing passage of scripture this morning. And Father, there's so much from this passage that is applicable to all of us. And so Father, please keep this preacher out of the way and let your word flow freely and that your spirit might move freely and touch hearts and lives here this morning. And Father, we're giving you the credit ahead of time of what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now there is a uh, sheet that goes with the sermon this morning that you can follow and that you can fill in some blanks. And so if you don't have one of those, let these, there's this guy, I guess. If you don't have a sheet to fill out, it was stuffed in your bulletin, but then we were running out of bulletins because we, uh, had some printing problems. Okay. All right, now let me just say this about your sheets that you have in front of you. You are not to take your sheet and work ahead and try to guess at what the blanks are. Okay? All right. So far we have a snowstorm. Mike will get it. Okay, the title this morning, and you got your sheet, so if this never even comes up, at least you got your sheet. Right? So a little lad, here's some blanks coming up, a little lunch, there's a blank, a little lunch, and a large miracle. Miracle. So lunch and miracle in that first statement. And then John 6, 1 through 15. All right, so here's, here we go. Now we got it up. There it is. Those, those in red, it's not standing out really good, but the ones in red are your blanks. So you can follow along, but you cannot work ahead and try to figure out what the blanks are because you won't be paying attention. I could quote you something out of Hezekiah, but I don't want to keep using Hezekiah. All right, so John chapter 6, here's verse 1. Open up your scriptures to that, please. John chapter 6, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. Amen. If you need more time, speed up. John 1, 6. And after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, it starts off with just this phrase, after these things, but I want to explain to you what that's referring to. Jesus has been recruiting his disciples, has turned water into wine, he has kicked merchants out of the temple and Jesus has dealt with a Pharisee named Nicodemus and he stated for the first time John 3 16 that's significant and Jesus had dealt with the woman at the well has poured out his heart and concern about the needed harvest for souls has healed the nobleman's son has done a healing by the pool of Bethesda and has just finished teaching a group of doubting Jews. But other than that, he hasn't been busy. <laughs> now look at verse 2. John 6, 2. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. All right, here's a statement on the screen and also in your sheet. A huge crowd had followed Jesus because of his miracles healing the sick and the disease. And Jesus had a concern that too many knew him as a physical, physical healer rather than a spiritual healer of this world. So physical and spiritual 
Now look at verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And verse 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. So Jesus had retreated into an area to try to take a break. Let me read an illustration to you this morning. This is humorous. A woman was in the backyard hanging laundry when an old, tired-looking dog wandered into the yard. And she could tell from his collar and well-fed belly that he, was, he had a home. But when she walked into the house, the dog followed her, sauntered down the hall, and fell asleep in a corner. An hour later, he went to the door, and she let him out. And the next day, he was back, and he resumed his position in the hallway and slept for an hour. Now, this continued for several weeks. Curious, the woman pinned a note to his collar Every afternoon, your dog comes to my house to take a nap. The next day, the dog arrived with a different note pinned to his collar. He lives in a home with 10 children, and he's trying to catch up on his rest. Because <laughs> here, Jesus was trying to take a break. And John also gives us just a glimpse of what, what was occurring at this time in verse 4. Because he mentions that the Passover is near. It's interesting to note that the Passover was a time to be in Jerusalem, not Galilee, as this passage has told us, because they're 62 miles apart. So here's a statement on the screen. The people were following Jesus in the area of Galilee, and little do they know that they were following the real Passover lamb. They were not aware of that. They didn't understand that yet, and Jesus is hoping that they will. Now look at verses 5 and 6. Are you keeping up on your sheets? Are a number of you worried about getting every blank? No? Okay, well, great. Okay. If you do miss a blank, you can stick around afterwards and we'll make sure you get the blanks, okay? John 6, 5 and 6. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, I'm stressing that, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? In verse 6, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Isn't that interesting? And that Jesus had been teaching them that he was the God in flesh and that he was the master of every situation. Amen. Now, his disciples here are facing what I would refer to as an acid test or a growth test to see if they were listening to what he was teaching them and Christ was testing them at this point. Now check out this statement right here. We need to remember that it's not the stress or test that we face that is important, but our response to it that really counts in the eyes of God. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, please say amen. amen. Thank you. As you and I go through different tests and trials, God wants us to respond appropriately. He wants us to, to turn to him, and we'll talk about that more here in just a second. But Jesus knows exactly what he's about to do. There's no doubt about that. He's, he's going to develop their faith with a miracle of creating food that wasn't there before. But see, we serve a God that can make it, whatever out of nothing. Right? Right. All right, now look at verse 7. And Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. All right now, if Philip had one of these or one of these, I can see him 
calculating and figuring out exactly what they've got and how far it's going to go and who's going to end up with what. But he's, I think he's very analytical. If, if, if there had been pocket protectors around there, he probably would have had one. Okay? Uh, but imagine Philip with his calculations. If we have 5,000 men and approximately another 4,000 counting the women and the children, and if each, and if each were to get a, a small portion, then, then they would probably get a piece about the size of a crouton. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 we would have to, and we would have to buy the bread for around 200, 200 penny worth, and that would be equal to 200, 200 days of labor to pay for the bread, and everybody would get a crouton. This is Philip. I don't think I'm reading too much into this because he's, he's being very analytical, but here, now really, please, please don't miss this. Philip did what you and I do too often. We leave our Lord and Savior out of our calculations. Anybody been there and done that? Yeah. All right, six of us. And the rest of you are filling in your blanks. All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you some slack because you are busy filling in blanks this morning so you don't have a hand free to throw it up in the air. So only this morning will I give you a break and I'll never get you and never, never ever get you another study lesson to fill out. Yes, your pastor's got baggage. Okay, how about this one? We each need a Lord button on our calculators to factor in our God. Then the screen would read, anything is possible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, here's what I'm talking about. You're looking at your own life, your own situations, and you're calculating it up, and you're looking at it, and you're saying, this doesn't look good. Huh? Yeah. But see, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, there ought to be a Lord button on your calculator. You know? right. And see, then you hit the Lord button, and then the screen gets rid of all those bad figures, and it says, anything's possible with God. Amen. Huh? Amen. If you don't get anything else, please realize that too often you and I are going through things, and we don't take our Lord and Savior into our calculations of how this is going to turn out. Amen? amen? And not filling out any blanks right now. Say amen? Amen. Yeah. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Too often, I have not included my Lord and my Savior in my calculations and have worried myself sick. Amen. Oh, yeah. Lord, straighten us out, huh? All right, so let me ask you, do you think Philip passed the state test? No. No. Uh -uh. But here's a statement. And I'm so glad of this. God does not expect perfection. But he expects, and I should have put it in here, and deserves progress. Amen. You and I, and I know I am a work in progress, but God looks at our progress and, and he tests us and he wants to see how we respond to our circumstances and whether or not we got a Lord button on our calculator. And he wants to see us progress. Right? Yep. Okay. You know, Jesus was hoping that in the future, when faced with a calculated disaster, that Philip would turn to him and say, there's nothing too hard for you. You see that? That's, that's Jesus' goal, that his disciples would, would get to the point where as he tested them and developed them, that when they came up against some impossible situation and they got their calculator by, you know, just for example, out and they're punching it in and they're going, oh, we're in trouble. But then they hit the Lord button and they said, there's nothing impossible with my Lord. I say, nothing too hard for you. Amen. Oh, wow. One of my favorite movies 
No. My favorite movie is Facing the Giants. If you've never seen Facing the Giants, you are not a complete individual. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. I, when Gina sees me get Facing the Giants out of the cabinet and poke it into the DVD player, she knows that I need a boost. Because <laughs> I can watch that movie, but at the, towards the end of the movie, they had just won their state champion, and I just kind of blew part of that for you all. Yeah. But, <laughs> And they win another one, and she has a baby. All right, but anyway. <laughs> hey, I've seen it over and over and over, and I just still enjoy it. So if I just spilled some of the beans on just part of it, you'll get over it. You'll enjoy it. But the coach goes around in, in the locker room at the end of this game where, where David has just faced the Giants and has kicked like a 50-yard goal field goal, and then and Brock has built the wall and, and defended when everybody else was giving up. Yeah, I know, I know this movie. <laughs> but then in the locker room, after it's all said and done, and they got this big trophy, he's going around, the coach is asking them, tell me, is there anything too hard for God? David says, no, coach, nothing's too hard for God. He goes over to Brock and he says, Brock, tell me, is there, is there anything too hard for God? And he says, no, coach, there's nothing too hard for God. Yeah. And I, I'm sitting on this old floor. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> you are not complete unless you've seen that movie. All right, let's, let's go on. Verses 8 and 9. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? <laughs> and I tell you what, Andrew is doing a better job of passing the test than what Philip did. At least he's taking inventory to figure out, well, what, what do we have to work with? All right, let me, let me say this. There's a gentleman in this church that has a large mount bass that's hanging on the wall of his house, and his wife just sang a solo, and, and they live right down across the valley here. But the, the large mount bass is just under 13 pounds. And he might be sitting here this morning going, well, if they had two of my fish, they would have gone <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah. The fish was only like 10 eight. So I'm the one that put it in the net. He lies. That is not the story. <laughs> he lies. Wow. Now, see, these are the siblings last Sunday that, that he said, hey, my sister's older this week. She's 40. Yeah. Yes. Amen. You know, so, you know. But nothing's impossible with God. You guys could get along. <laughs> Thank you for that illustration. <laughs> oh, oh my. But at least Andrew's taken inventory of what's available. But he asks this question, but what are they among so many? Let me personalize that statement to our day and age right now. Maybe you ask yourself this, how can I ever make a spiritual impact among so many ungodly people and who am I among so many? Right? Yeah, well there's more to this. Listen to this. You might have a son or a daughter or a granddaughter or a grandson and some of you may have a great, great granddaughter, great, great grandson and maybe more. I don't know. But imagine them stating or at least thinking this. I'm a teenager and I'm trying to live a godly and a separated, there's a blank, separated life Then how can I keep on swinging, swimming rather upstream alone against the current? Who am I among so many? Who am I among so many? 
Here's, here's another statement. Our kids and our grandkids are being inundated by this world, by other kids, by science teachers, by TV, by text, by smartphones, by the internet, by classes promoting the gay lifestyle. And you may be crying out, who am I among so many? Right? I love the fact that Lynn Taylor, in her classes at school, she has kids in her class, and I think they discuss this ahead of time, so that if, that if there's something being taught from the textbook, such as, uh, you know, if it's talking about creation, it's, it's not creation by God, it's hot water dripping on a brick and so forth, she's got, she's got people in her classes who will say, Mrs. Taylor, what do you believe? And then she can freely express exactly what the Word of God says. Amen. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, my Richard, you married up. <laughs> she tells you that. Here's another statement. Too often we're discounting that the impossible can be possible with the right response to the God who specializes in the impossible. Pastor Gary, dude, make it clear. Let me just read it again. Maybe it'll soak in. Too often we're discounting that the impossible can become possible with the right response to the God who specializes in the impossible. Amen. Because when our Lord and our Savior does the things that seemingly are impossible, then he gets the credit because we can't do it. Right? Yeah. Right. Oh, wow. You know, here, notice this. Here's this young man. And this is, this is an actual event. We did, as we started to read the scripture, we did not start off with once upon a time. Right? right? This occurred. Jesus fed thousands in the wilderness with two little fish. And five loaves of bread. It's five, isn't it? Five loaves of bread. Jesus did that. It actually occurred. Amen. God did that. But notice that this little lad is not mentioned by name in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or in our passage in John. He's never mentioned by name. Let me, let me read this to you. I want to publicly praise you folks that are faithful in attendance, faithful in giving, faithful in praying, faithful in working behind the scenes. I want to praise the Sunday school teachers. I want to praise the youth workers, the nursery workers, especially the work nursery workers, children's church workers, prayer warriors, dishwashers, table wipers, toilet cleaners, diaper changers, furnace repairers, painters, bookkeeper, flower waterers. I don't know if that's a word or not. Church cleaners, snow shovelers, grass mowers, meal planners, sound booth techs. And I want to praise you because you don't care if your name is mentioned. Amen. He was never mentioned by name. Not once. And please, if I didn't mention what you do just now, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> and do you really? All right, okay. To check, check your heart out, man, please. But I thank God. Here's a statement. I thank God for people who give what they have in their basket without anyone knowing who they are. Give everything that's in their basket without anybody needing to know who they are. Now watch what Jesus does against all odds. Verse 10 in the scriptures. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Let me mention to you in the account that Mark gave to us, he, he, the, the, it was more specifics given. And they were instructed to sit down in groups of 50s and 100s. I, I, as I looked this over this morning, I, I believe with all my heart, I can't say this dogmatically, 
But anybody that wanted to come along later and say, well, there weren't really that many people there. You know what I'm saying? But because they're 100 here, 100 there, 50 here, 50 here, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100 somebody else could say immediately without any hesitation, did you not see the groups? There was at least 5,000 there. And that would have squelched that right there. Does that make sense? Yes. Here, this is so true. The miracle, this miracle will become even more amazing if you kidders consider how many teenagers were there. <laughs> how long has it been since you fed a teenager? Yeah. So that even is more amazing if you think of how many teenagers were there. All right, now put yourself in this situation of feeding eight to 9,000 people in the middle of nowhere with two fish and five loaves. That would be impossible. Even, I tell you what, we got some ladies around this church that go in that kitchen and they can, can, it can produce some wonderful meals. But even they would say, nope. Can't do that, right? Well, here, here's, here's some practical advice for you this morning and for me. Perhaps what you're facing today is putting you in despair. And perhaps you have difficult relationships with family members. And perhaps you're facing a crisis connected to your health. And maybe you're, you're facing what seems to be a hopeless financial situation. And perhaps you are amazed by how far our nation has gone the wrong direction so quickly. And we had three veterans up here this morning. And if you were to talk to them individually, especially Mike, because he's mature. Not all these mature. He's going to turn off my microphone at any time, I know. But if you were to talk to Mike, it, yeah, right, any of our veterans that were up here this morning, and say, have you seen a significant slide in the spiritual aspect of our country since you served? And they would all go, yes. In my lifetime, I have seen a difference of night and day in our nation, in our schools, and so forth. But I tell you what, here, let this minister to you. Here's three statements, back to back to back, that if you'll just let God touch your heart, consider this. We all need to remember, what we all need to remember is that it isn't the great size of the need that matters. It isn't the small amount of our resources, our resources that matter. What matters is the power of God. Amen. That's what matters. I know you're busy, busy filling out your blanks and you can't respond, especially you guys because we can't do more than one thing at once. <laughs> Here. Well, I tell you what, I just, you know, if, if any time during the week you come up here and you kind of get in and wander through the building, and if you hear some commotion at the other end of the building in my office, it's just me. But when God lays something on my heart, it, it just, it, it excites me. Well, check this out. If we are here today and know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and our joy has been replaced with fear, then we're focusing only on our situation and leaving God out of our calculations. Is that true? Yes. You know, those of you that work with computers, and you got your screen going, and you got these little icons up in the corner where you can minimize or fully full screen, too often we're going full screen with the problem and we've minimized God. Does that, does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. I caught you on that, but it, it does. We do that and we shouldn't. Now look at verse 11, please. Almost done, all right? Nobody said amen. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. 
and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. I, I like this. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, now consider, let me say this, consider what Jesus didn't say here. He didn't say, Father, what a tight spot you put me in. And Father, how do you expect me to take, how do you expect me to feed all these people out here in the middle of nowhere? And all I got is, is this happy meal to deal with here. That's all I've got. Maybe you're here today and you know, no, no, that's not that one. Let's go to the next one, Mike, if you could. It's on your sheet. Is it up? It was better. Uh huh. Here is what maybe what Jesus prayed, and I'm not saying this dogmatically, but thank you, Father, for what we have. If we would just do that, we'd be better people, wouldn't we? Thank you, Father, for what we have. And let these people see your power today. Let this miracle open the eyes of these hungry people to see that I am more than a healer and that I am the bread of life. And bless this lad who gave everything that he had. Amen. So what we have, the bread and everything, are the blanks here. That one's not there. It's not there? It's not there? Send me home early. I don't know. <laughs> Did we skip that one? All right, so yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it. All right, here's one that maybe didn't make it on the screen. Maybe you're here today and you're looking at your intellect or your talents or your finances and you're looking up and crying out, I don't have much to work with here. Yeah. You know, I, right after I put that statement on, I thought, I thought back of Spencer. And a number of years now ago, I walked up to Spencer and I said, Spencer, I think God wants you just to start teaching a Sunday school class. And he had that deer in the headlight look. And he says, let me tell you something, preacher. And he says, I was back in high school and I had speech class. And the teacher came to me and said, if you don't give a speech in front of the class, you will fail the class. Pastor, I failed the class. <laughs> I think you're talking to the wrong guy. But then he, he said, okay, I'm going to give what I got in my basket. And maybe he was... Maybe he was saying, Father, look at what I got. I can't do this. But I saw God move in his heart and his life, and I saw him touch some lives as, as he taught Amen. Sunday school. Amen. Yeah. All right, what's going to come up next here? Here we go, verses 12 and 13. And when they were filled... He said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Here's a statement. When God meets our needs, he does so completely. He does so completely. In verse 13, Therefore they gathered themselves together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the, let's see, with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. You see, let me, let me mention, mention this to you. Gina has put up with a lot. And I'm, I'm a... Carol, is that you? <laughs> and I remember, I remember she told me about this the next morning. She said, we are eating some homemade bread. I love homemade bread. And I had gone to bed with bread. <laughs> I was finishing the bread as I was starting to sleep. And Gina came in, and that, and that roll was hanging out of my mouth. <laughs> and she came up and took the bread and pulled it, 
bolted out of my mouth. But I tell you what, I don't think anything that was in those baskets was like my roll that had been slobbered on and half eaten. I think everything that was put into those baskets was complete. And so, yes, continue to pray for Gina. Um, and no scraps, no bite taken out, no half-eaten fish. I believe that these 12 baskets held untouched food. Because I think Jesus was making something perfectly clear. I can feed 9,000 people with two little fish and five little loaves and have more leftovers than what I started with. That's what he was saying. So it wasn't a mess in those baskets. I think it was complete fish and, and, and complete rolls. And I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, if the miracle occurred as Jesus handed it to his disciples or as the disciples started to distribute it or if it was both. But it happened. And God did it. And I believe that it was the best fish ever served. And I believe it was the freshest bread ever served. Amen. Yeah. That's what God can do. Wow. Ephesians 3.20 comes to mind. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Yeah. All right, now verses 14 and 15 and we're done. Kind of. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. I'm trying to take another break. So a little lad, a little lunch, and a large miracle. But let me I tell you what, as the week wore on, the Lord's laid something else on my heart that I want to share with you, and then we'll, then we'll close. <clears throat> Maybe you're here this morning, and you are calculating that if you do enough good things, you'll go to heaven. The scripture says that's, that's not true. Amen. Maybe you're... Maybe you're here this morning and you're calculating that you've got plenty of time to make the eternal decisions. Our lives are vapors. We had the opportunity Friday night to sit down with a couple and the husband was telling us that when he was a senior in high school, his mother, his father, and his sister were killed in an automobile accident just that quick. Yeah. If you're thinking that you got plenty of days left and calculating it out, please don't have that mindset. Because we could be done here at any time. Any time. God is not a respecter of age. Right? right? And maybe you're here this morning, and I'll quit with this, and you're calculating out that you're in trouble. Maybe you don't have a Lord button. Today, you could have a Lord button. Anything's possible with God. Amen. Please bow your head and close your eyes.